Hey, Chemstars, this is Mrs. Vandalay bringing you another Chemstar video. Uh, this one it will only be about Boyle's Law. So if I were you, I would have, you know, your paper, your pencil, and a calculator handy uh, as we do this and, and really most of the other videos uh, as we go on in this chapter here, okay? So Boyle's Law is going to determine, uh, or it, it relates pressure and volume. That is how we define Boyle's Law. Uh, Boyle was Robert Boyle, an English uh, scientist back in, I think, the... Uh, 1800s. I may be wrong about that. Uh, but he was the first one to really see this relationship of gases uh, and how if like pressure changes, how volume will. All right, so you're going to be uh, able to predict the effect of changing pressure or volume. So let me kind of refresh your memory a little bit. Do you remember this? I showed you a lot of this in the last video, so I'm just going to do a little bit here. I'm not going to spend nearly as much time. So I just want to remind you of what's happening here. So if I'm going to see the relationship between pressure and volume, I want to hold temperature constant, okay? And so the only thing I'm going to do is change uh, the volume and change the pressure, okay? Well, I think it's easier to change the volume. So right now we're at 300K, which we wanna keep constant, and my width is 10 nanometers, and my pressure is somewhere around 11.6, 11.7. So what's gonna happen once again if I squeeze this in? Come on, you can do it, there we go. What happened to pressure? Well, didn't pressure go up? Yes, it did. Why is it? There's less space, so there's more collisions. So when volume goes down, pressure goes up. What happens if I do this? Now this is greater than your 10. And what did pressure do? It's down again, isn't it? So if volume goes up, pressure goes down, doesn't it? So we call that an indirect relationship. All right, let's go back to our note page. All right, so I actually want to go back a page. Oops, not that way. There we go. All right, I want to go back a page. Yeah, like this. And look at this right here again. All right. So we saw that there was a mathematical relationship here. All right. That if we take pressure times volume, I'm going to get a constant. And this is what the graph will look like. So as pressure is high, volume is low. If volume is high, pressure is low. All right, that's what this graph shows me. Okay, so let's go back to where we were. Okay, so let's try this. What kind of relationship is this again? As um, pressure goes up, volume went down. That is an indirect relationship, isn't it? So like we saw, the arrows are going in opposite directions, aren't they? So now what? Um, pressure can be in really any unit of pressure that we've talked about. Remember in the very first video, we talked about pascals, kilopascals, millimeters of mercury, ATM. You are not bound to have a certain unit. It can be whatever you're given. Volume can be in milliliters, liters, quarts, gallons, all right, whatever a volume would be. So mathematically, all right, watch this. If... I multiply my volume and my pressure, I get a constant. Well, what if I have a new set of conditions? Isn't that equal to the same set of conditions? All right, yes it is. So what does that mean? If A equals B and B equals C, then what? A equals C, so yes. This is the equation we want to use. Now, I do want to go back and look at my graph one more time. So here's my pressure. Here's my volume. Here are my units. And here are my units, okay? So that is my graph. Now, let's pick a constant, any constant. Let's pick, I don't know, eight, all right? Eight's a good number. So let's pick eight. Um, let me do this real quick. There we go. So isn't eight times one equal to eight? And isn't two times four equal to eight? And isn't four times two equal to eight? And isn't eight times one equal to eight? Yes. All right, catch that? 
So now what? Let's kind of connect these dots here. So that would be my graph if my constant were eight. All right, now, is it always gonna be eight? No, for this set of conditions, yes. All right, for whatever number of molecules of gas I have, for whatever temperature I'm at, yes, that constant's gonna be eight. But if I change something, like the number of molecules or the temperature, then yes, you're gonna have a different K. But the point is, given the same number of molecules and given the same uh, temperature, they will always be equal to eight. So that would be my indirect graph, okay? So you're gonna multiply P1, V1 equals P2, V2, and you always get, in this case, eight. So let's look at some examples. Now, I don't know if you've ever flown in an airplane before. I know I have. And so even though when you have ample supply of oxygen gas, air, uh, airplane passengers become uncomfortable when the cabin loses pressure. Thank goodness that has never happened to me when I'm in flying a plane. I think you've seen the movies where the, the little cups come down from the ceiling, all right? Um, you know, I guess we could ask, you know, people who've really had that happen, how do you feel? And they probably said, I was scared to death, all right? Well, if they kind of got rid of that, well, how did your body feel? They said, I felt different, all right? So why would they feel different if your body was subjected to a sudden drop in pressure? Well, what's gonna happen? Did you know you have gases in your body? Does that make sense to you? Doesn't oxygen be needed to be transported throughout your body for you know life processes? Well, yes, it does. You have gases in your body. It's been, they're dissolved, but you have gases in your body. All right, so what happens if pressure goes down? Well, the volume of those gas molecules in your body is gonna expand, all right? And that's just gonna feel weird, all right? as I've been told, okay? I don't know that for, for a fact firsthand, okay? What about another one? I'm sure some of you have had this experience, okay? If you climb a mountain, well, go down to the, to the um, you know, down south in, in Tennessee, all right? And, and go on the Appalachian Trail or something, all right? So you can climb a mountain. Or if you even go up an elevator, sometimes your, your ears pop. I know for me, sometimes when we're driving down Rapid Run and going into Addison, you're going down a hill, sometimes my ears will pop just doing that, all right? So if there's a change in altitude, your ears pop. Well, why is that? Go back. Do you remember what we said on the very first page? Let's take a look. Do you remember this graph here? Hopefully you do. So what does it say here? As altitude goes up, pressure goes down. Why? If you're gas molecules. Why? Because gravity is going to be pulling them down closer to the surface of the earth instead of up on a mountain. All right. So you may have heard of thin air. Why? Because you have fewer gas molecules. I told you why there's dead bodies on Mount Everest, because helicopters can't go up and take them down. All right. So you have thin air. Why? You have fewer gas molecules. If you have fewer gas molecules, what did we already learn? Pressure goes down. So let's apply that to the next question then. All right. So if you're climbing a mountain, you have fewer gas molecules. If you have fewer gas molecules, your pressure goes down. You have fewer collisions, right? So what happens when your, your uh, pressure goes down, your volume goes up? So why do your ears pop? All right. Well, you know what? You have this little flap thing in your ear. I don't know the technical term for it that will adjust. Okay. So if the uh, pressure goes down, volume goes up and that little flap thing in your ear is going to open up to allow that expansion. All right. Um, so it causes your ears to pop. Okay. Now, what about the next one? Carbonated beverages pop when you open it. I'm sure you've had this case before. You, you get out a, a brand new bottle of, of pop and you open it up and it spills all over the place. You know what I'm talking about? I'm sure you have. Why? All right. Why do you hear that? Psst. All right, when you open up the tab, what's going on? Think about it. The Coca-Cola or the Pepsi bottlers, when they bottle your carbonated beverage, whichever you're picking, all right, it's under high pressure. There's actually something called Henry's Law that says as pressure goes up, solubility goes up for gases. So they can dissolve more gases under high pressure. So when they bottle it, it's under high pressure. Well, what are you doing as soon as you're opening up the cap? You're going from a high pressure inside the bottle to atmospheric pressure, which is much lower. So pressure 
drop. So what's going to happen when pressure drops? The volume does what? The volume goes up. So why do you see that fizz all of a sudden? Because the volume of the gases are now expanding. That's your fizz. All right. So I wrote the carbon dioxide and soda when bottled is under high pressure. When you open the bottle, there's a sudden drop in pressure. So volume of carbon dioxide increases, causing the foaming and sometimes causing a mess. I'll never forget when I was at my grandma's house, when I was a little girl, probably in elementary school, and I had to go down the basement to go grab some grape soda because we're going to have some grape soda floats, you know, some vanilla ice cream in it. So what did I do? I like ran up the stairs with a grape soda bottle. And as I was running upstairs, I was jiggling it. I didn't know I was jiggling it, but I probably did. So when grandma opened it up, guess what happened to all that grape soda all over her kitchen? Yeah, she wasn't too happy, but we still had some grape soda float when we're done. I still remember that. All right. So let's keep going. Oh, this is a good one. A uh, tornado, which is a low pressure system, passes by Oak Hills High School. All right, you crack open a window. Why is that common procedure for a tornado drill? You should crack open your window, no lie. Uh, if you're at home, all right, and if you're the air sirens go off, it might be a good idea to somewhere in your house maybe crack open a window. Why is that? Because what happens when pressure goes down, volume, of course, goes up. So what's happening? The gases in your room are starting to expand, all right? And they will go to the most weakest point in the room, which is your windows, the glass, and they will expand out to the point where possibly uh, they can blow out the windows, not blow in, blow out. But what happens then, you now have flying glass, which could now go back inside and, um, um, you know, cause damage or it could hurt somebody. So you can alleviate that flying glass issue if you just crack open a window and then the window won't break. I have another story. I was at my grandma's house. They live in Iowa and or they lived in Iowa. And anyway, I was now in middle school. I went to grandma's house a lot. And every summer I was always over there. Uh, so anyway, one summer in Iowa, they had a tornado come very close to the house and the sirens are going off. And I was upstairs in the bedroom reading and I remember panicking because as I was going to run down to the basement, I couldn't open up the door. Well, think about it. Your bedroom door typically opens into the room, not into the hallway. Why could I not open up the door? Is because that volume expansion happened and I was fighting against that increased volume of gases in the room. I didn't know this at the time. I just know that I was scared to death and I was, you know, yelling and screaming. And finally, Grandpa came up and pushed the door open for me and we went down to the basement. Um, that, that day, I'll never forget, the uh, tornado took the roof off of the house across the street. It was that close. But anyway, I'll never forget that. Hopefully you learned something there too. So now what? Mathematically. Okay. So a balloon contains 30 liters of gas at 103 kilopascals. What is the volume of the helium when the balloon rises to an altitude or the pressure is only 25? Now, again, we're going to assume the temperature is constant. So I want to go back and use the equation I showed you earlier. All right, right here. This equation is be really, really, really important. Okay, so that's the equation we're going to use. Again, if you don't have a calculator, uh, get one. Use your phone calculator. Be ready to do some calculations. Okay, so how I always do this, and I recommend you do this too, is I write down the equation. How many times has that been in the directions? Write down the equation, show your substitution, show the answer with correct sig figs and correct units, all right? So there's the equation. Now I want to substitute. What are my first set of conditions right here? I have volume and I have a pressure. They're asking you, what will the volume of the helium be when the balloon rises to an L through the pressure is only 25? So I'm going to plug in. My first set of conditions, here is my P1, here is my V1. How do I know that? I look at my units. Liters is a unit of volume and kilopascals is a unit of pressure. What is the volume of helium? So you're looking for V2 when the altitude, uh, when, you, when the balloon goes up, when the pressure is only 25. So pressure is going way down. So watch, I'm saying pressure dropped. So what's the relationship? If pressure goes down, volume should go up, all right? So let's check this out. How are you going to solve this problem? I think you're going to take 103 times 30 
divided by, get this over here, right? Divide both sides by 25. So go ahead and do that. What is 103 times 30 divided by 25? All right, make sure you know how to do this math, folks. And yes, this is what you get. Now, what, what does what I do? Well, this is what my calculator gave me. I think there's some maybe extra digits. I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, how many sig figs do I need? I have three sig figs, three sig figs, and three sig figs. So my answer should have three sig figs, so I round it up. Notice I have the right sig figs. Notice I have the right unit. What else should I do? Let's see. So volume should increase. So it went from 30 liters to 124 liters. Does that mean it went up? It did. Volume went up. Okay. Good thing. All right, let's try the next one. Nitrous oxide, which is N2O, is used and is, as an anesthetic. Okay, it puts you out, knocks you out. So if you're gonna have surgery, uh, that's what they can use to put you under. Uh, the pressure on 2.5 liters of uh, nitrous oxide changes from 100 kilopascals. Hey folks, real quick, can we do, do me a huge favor? All right, I hate one sig fig, let's make it a hundred point. There you go. I like that much better. All right. So a uh, hundred three sig figs kilopascal and 40.5. If the temperature doesn't change, what's the new volume? All right. So we're talking about pressures and volume. So we're going to use Boyle's law. So there's my equation. What's next? I need to have substitution. So let's plug in the values that we know. So here are my original set of conditions. I have a two point a uh, 50 liter of nitrous oxide goes from 100 kilopascals down to 40.5 kilopascals, all right? So here's my initial set of conditions, 100 kilopascals, 2.5 liters. I have a new pressure. What's my new volume, okay? So, oops, uh, what am I going to do? Take 100 times 2.5. You can do that in your calculator. And now, how do I get rid of the 40.5 on the right-hand side? You're going to divide it, all right? So you're going to divide that 250 by 40.5. And this is what I got. Hopefully, I got it right. Um, so again, once I put that decimal point there, because I hate one sig fig, um, I have three sig figs, three sig figs, three sig figs. So I need to make that two really drop off. So I get 6.17 liters. Now, notice that pressure dropped again. Okay, went from 100 to 40.5. So what did volume, what should it do? It should go up. Did it? Yeah, it went from 2.5 to 6.17. All right, so it did go up. I believe this is our last one, is it not? All right, so we have a gas with a volume of 4.0 and a pressure of 1.6 is allowed to expand. Oh, volume is now doing it. Okay, what's the new pressure? Let's do this. So here is my P1V1 equals P2V2. Here's my first set of conditions, which is 1.6 atmospheres times 4.0 liters uh, equals P2 times 12.0. Hey, by the way, volume went up. What should pressure do? Pressure should go down, right? So now I'm all said and done. I'm going to take 1.6 times 4.0, divide by 12.0, uh, and this is what I got. And yes, it did. I just want to show you one more thing before I'm done. How do you know what unit your final answer is? Well, watch. Liters can cancel out on both sides, right? What unit is left? ATM. All right, that's why I knew that was my unit. Same thing over here. Kilopascals canceled out. So what's the unit that's left is liters. All right, and that's what unit I have here. All right, and same situation up in number one. Uh, kilopascals can cancel out on both sides. What unit is left? Liters. So that's what my unit here is. Okay. So hopefully that helped. Um, that is Boyle's Law, the relationship between pressure and volume. Uh, hopefully your homework will go well for you on this. So try it yourself. And then when you're done, go and, and check your work. All right. So don't wait to be great. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.